No, 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 the speakers. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh. Thanks. Okay, so our next speaker is Maya Verniori um, from the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Physics of Solids and the Donosti International Physics Center. And she will give us a, a lecture and a tutorial on the role of crystalline symmetries in band theory, hands on ZDUPAC and IR. IREP. IREP, sorry. Okay, thank you, Maya, and the floor is yours. Mm. Um, okay, uh, thank you, Antimo, for the introduction and uh, being in charge of everything here, I can imagine it's not easy. So, yeah, in, in this talk, I'm going to talk about how to diagnose topology when we, uh, we will we'll have uh, crystalline symmetries, basically when we have a crystal with symmetries. And I'm going to give an introduction to the theoretical background, and then we're going to do a hands-on session on c 2 pack and, and IREP, as Antimo said. And I'm gonna do this together with uh, Mikel Iraola and Inigo Robredo, since these are the ones that have mainly developed and used these two codes, and they have thought about uh, very interesting uh, exercises. Okay, so before the crystalline symmetries start playing an important, important role in topological materials, the periodic table of topological, can you hear me? The periodic table of topological materials uh, was actually uh, given by the Tenfold Way, where uh, they considered the um, most important anti-unitary symmetries, time reversal symmetry, particle hole, and chiral symmetry. And here you have uh, the different classes and uh, the dimensions, because topology is about symmetry and dimensionality, the square of the, of the main symmetries, and the topological classification. So, we can recognize uh, some familiar uh, topological phases. Here we have uh, the churn insulator, including the Haldane model and an integer quantum hole effect. We don't need any symmetry. And here below we have the 2D and 3D topological insulators. And uh, these, these topological phases were actually protected by one of these anti-unitary symmetries. Um, uh, for before, the way we could uh, diagnose topology in, in a system was, as, was in, as has been introduced uh, in the past day, by calculating the Wilson loops of the non-Abelian uh, very phase, by using these days the displacement of the Vanier centers, which is uh, a way of calculating, uh, of course, uh, whether a system is topological or not. But uh, with the inclusion of translation and, and crystalline symmetries, in particular inversion for uh, central symmetric systems, uh, Fu and Cain propose the parity criterion formula that says, okay, if we have a trivial insulator and a topological insulator, uh, if we go from one to the other one, we face, uh, we see a phase transition. And Phases transition in band theory needs to happen by closing a gap. So if we go from one uh, phase to another one, we need to close a gap and reopen again. And something needs to happen in the, in, the, in the bands to have these uh, different phases. Well, what happens is that bands get inverted. So uh, the parity criterion formula, what claims is that if we consider the um, Eigen, the, the product of the eigenvalues at the high symmetry points, the inversion eigenvalues, and it's odd, we're gonna have a topological phase. If it's even, we're gonna have a trivial phase. And this actually accelerates and uh, makes more efficient the diagnosis of uh, topological materials. Uh, later on, uh, it was discovered in 2011 by Lian Fu that also point group symmetries can protect topological phases. This was the case of the mirror churn uh, insulator in tin telluride. So if we have mirrors in a system, if we have mirror symmetry in a system, we're gonna have different mirror planes, and in each mirror plane, our wave function is gonna um, have the, the, I mean, our bands are gonna have the eigenvalues of the mirror operation. So uh, if we define a subspace for each eigenvalue of the mirror symmetry for i or minus i, if we have a spin or recoupling or plus minus one if we don't, we have a two-dimensional block diagonal Hamiltonian and in this two-dimensional block di diagonal Hamiltonian we can define a turn number. And this turn number protects a topological phase that actually displays a Dirac cone in uh, some particular surfaces, is protected by mirror symmetry and one band uh, 
belongs to the eigenvalue plus i and the other one to the eigenvalue minus i. What I want to say here is that the eigenvalue of the symmetry operators, uh, when we start dealing with crystalline symmetries, start playing an important role and calculating them uh, becomes uh, also uh, very important. So, um, keep uh, playing with uh, crystal symmetries. Other type of topological phases were found, like the hourglass fermion and the high order TIs, and a new C2 index or a symmetry indicator was defined. So the parity criterion of one cane is related to one band inversion, but the C4 index is related with two band inversion because we can have two band inversion in different subspaces. And for example, in the case of our glass fermion, if we have glide symmetry, what we get is like two direct cones in the surface. And in the case of the higher order TI, when we have inversion, what we get is uh, hinge states at the edges of, uh, of our system, in this, in this case, bismuth. So uh, crystalline symmetries uh, add to the topological uh, classification a lot of variety and it enrich uh, the field, but it was somehow uh, a bit chaotic at the beginning because there was not like a clear classification of, of the crystal symmetries. And this is what I'm gonna explain now and why uh, the IREP code that Miguel has developed becomes uh, very important. So if we consider the crystal structure of a 3D material, we have uh, 230 space groups, and the ingredients of the crystalline structure are unit uh, lattice translation, point group operations, non-symorphic symmetries, and of course we have orbitals and atoms in some lattice positions. So, um, so we have our crystal, and now I need to define a few concepts. One is the concept of the atomic limit that was introduced uh, by David on Tuesday, but I want to uh, bring it back again because it's very, very important. So uh, David and Alexei um, uh, developed or described in 2011 was the obstruction to an atomic limit when we are dealing with a topological phase. And the atomic limit is defined, or the trivial phase is defined by calculating the Vanier states, integrating over the block functions, and it happens when we, have, uh, we can have a set of Vanier states maximally localized on the atomic side. Whenever this happens, if we have an insulator, this insulator is gonna be trivial because the charge is absolutely localized in the atomic side. Topological phases is about what is happening in the charge, about what is happening in the gap. Okay, so the atomic limit is uh, one concept and now we're gonna bridge it to another concept that comes from uh, group theory. So I want to define now, there is a question. Uh, C4, what is the symmetry indicator to detect a HOTI is C4, C4 equals two. Okay, so uh, now I'm gonna define uh, another uh, concept that is very important for this uh, construction of classification of topological crystalline symmetries, which is elementary band representation is EVR. And it works in the following way. So whenever we have a crystal structure within the same lattice, let's say the same space group, we can have different arrangements of the atoms. We can have one atom per unit cell, two atoms per unit cell in the honeycomb lattice, or three atoms per unit cell in the Kagome. And this multiplicity of the atoms in the unit cell is defined by the Vykov position. 1A, we have one atom, A, the most symmetric uh, position in the cell. 2B, we have two atoms, B, the second most symmetric uh, position in the cell, and so on and so forth. So the wave function is not gonna transform in the same way where we have a triangular lattice where we preserve C6, or we have a honeycomb lattice, okay? So each arrangement determines different representations. Now, if we pick up, for example, the honeycomb lattice and we add orbitals, we can add S or PC orbitals or uh, PX and PY. So if we add S or PC orbitals, the rotational symmetry is gonna be preserved in the XY plane, but if we add uh, PX and PY, they transform into each other, which means that the S and PC represent by themselves an irreducible representation, but the PX and PY, they need to come together. I mean, they can not be disentangled because they transform into each other. All right, so um, if we consider uh, the symmetries of the side that are called the side symmetry group, which are the symmetries that leave the point invariant and the orbitals that we add and the lattice, with these three ingredients, we can uniquely define the bands that we're gonna see in the reciprocal space. 
And we can uniquely define them because the wave function is gonna transform in a particular way at the high symmetry points. And this transformation is gonna be given by the little groups at the different high symmetry points, okay? So if we have a uh, honeycomb lattice, um, S orbitals and the two very bike of position, gamma one, gamma four, K3, M1, M4 are gonna define the bands in the reciprocal space. And in the same way, when we have PX and PY orbitals, we're gonna have also the corresponding uh, little groups at the high symmetry points defining these bands, okay? So we have the atomic limit and we have the elementary band representation and what is the relation of this with topology? The relation of this with topology comes from this paper from Michelle and Zach and other papers from Zach too, where they claim that elementary band representations are actually connected in reciprocal space. And they are connected in reciprocal space because actually what happens is an elementary band representation defines a charge localized in the atomic side, which is actually the atomic limit. So an elementary band representation described by these three ingredients, orbital, atomic side, and a lattice, what is actually describing is a set of maximally localized bands that can be vanirisable respecting all the crystal symmetries, right? So, which means that what we are doing by defining an elementary band representation, we are defining an actually an atomic limit of uh, a set of bands. Okay, so the way we are gonna classify the topological phases in, in, in materials is by, we are gonna classify all possible trivial phases and whenever our phase does not belong to one of these trivial phases, it has to be topological. So we have our lattice, we see whether we can vanirize it by looking at whether we have an elementary band representation. If the answer is yes, we're not gonna have a topological insulator and the charge is gonna be localized on the lattice. On the contrary, if we have our lattice and we cannot vanirize it, which means we cannot define an elementary band representation, these bands are gonna be disconnected in reciprocal space and the gap is gonna be topological, okay? And the charge is gonna be not localized at the atomic side. All right, so this is actually why um, we need to, uh, it's very important to actually um, calculate the IREPS. How do we calculate the IREPS? So I think uh, seeing this uh, once in your life uh, is not gonna harm, at least, and at least you know where things come from. Okay, so we have a honeycomb lattice uh, with these generators uh, to the Vikov position and PC spinful uh, orbitals in this site. And um, we're gonna calculate the side symmetry group of G that leaves the Q invariant, okay? So um, let's say, so the, our generators are C2, C3, and M1. So if we apply C3 to our site, this site, we move it to this other one, and by a lattice translation, we can go to the original side. So C3 is a symmetry operation of the side symmetry group. If we apply mirror, absolutely nothing happens, so mirror is also a side of the side symmetry group. And if we apply C2, we move it here, and there is no way we can go back to the original side by a combination of the lattice parameters. So C2 is not gonna be part of the side symmetry group, okay? So the side symmetry group is gonna be described by the point group C3B. All right. So, um, what is the irrep that actually describe this uh, C3B of the lattice? So what we need to do is calculate the matrix representation for each symmetry operation and then sum up the traces. When we sum up the traces, we go to the crystallographic tables and we identify that actually is gamma six, the IREP that actually is related to the traces of the, uh, of the symmetry operations of this uh, point group. All right, so uh, now that we have the side symmetry group, we need to consider the coset of uh, our system. And the coset are actually the set of operations that we need to add to the side symmetry group to reproduce the full group. So the elements of the coset are gonna be C2 and the identity, all right? So the multiplicity of the coset are gonna be, uh, is gonna be two, and this is why actually we have um, 
Uh, multiplicity 2 in the unit cell is related to the fact that we have a 2B, our atom placed in the 2B by composition. All right, so we have identified the, the point group that actually leaves the, the, the Q invariant, and we have identified the cause of the composition. And actually, what we do is we want to induce the irreducible representation in the full space group. All right, and for that, what we do is define a matrix representation. So everything is about matrix that actually uh, under which our wave function transform in real space. So for each, um, let's say, generator of the unit cell will have a different matrix. Well, I mean, I, I don't wanna, this is, this is quite, um, let's say, difficult to explain in such a short time, but basically we have to define a matrix representation for each symmetry operator and we need to Fourier transfer to reciprocal space, all right? And here we have the elements of the cause of the composition and the translation and the generators. Well, uh, there are books where you can see that. So we go to reciprocal space, we have our matrix representation now as a function of K, and our matrix actually, uh, it has all the operations, but it's gonna be divided in different block diagonals. And what we do is again the same. We calculate the traces or of all the operators for our matrix representation for the different K points and we compare with the tables. And what we see is that our uh, at least uh, representation in reciprocal space at the gamma point is gonna be given by gamma seven and gamma eight because it's actually the ones that are produced by uh, adding the traces, the traces that we get in our matrix. Okay. This is how we calculate the reducible representation in, um, and now uh, we go back again to uh, topology. So um, we have our uh, real space, three ingredients, orbitals, lattice, and uh, bike of position. And with this, we can define the, the bands in reciprocal space by the irreducible representations at this high symmetry point. Okay. So um, all this uh, has been tabulated in a Bilbao crystallographic server in the section topological quantum chemistry. So if you want to know what should be uh, the, let's say the, the AVRs, the bands that are connected in a reciprocal space that you should check for your system, we go to this application, BandRep, we add here the, the space group, and this is what we get. So uh, for every uh, space group in, in reciprocal space, we have this table. These are the bike of positions, these are the reducible re representation in reciprocal space, and these are the possible EVRs at the high symmetric points. Okay, so these EVRs are gonna define a set of bands that are connected. These EVRs are gonna define another set of bands that are connected for the different bike of positions. So if you have your EREPs e at the high symmetry point, you can tell whether they form an elementary band representation or not. Uh, and also, there is this function where we, we tell you whether your bands are decomposable or not, because some of them, they cannot be decomposed, and they cannot actually display topological phases, but also some of them can be decomposed, all right? So there is all this information here. And um, if, for example, uh, you want to do it uh, like in a faster way, uh, Mikkel will talk about how to generate the file that needs to be uploaded in the in the application check topological map that can be calculated with irrep. It's called trace uh, text, and uh, you can get the results of all the symmetry indicators and the irreps at the high symmetry point. Okay. So basically, uh, what we want to know now in order to check whether our system is topological or not is what I'm showing you in the in the screen now. So we need to know. At the high symmetry points, what are the irreducible representation? And with this information and uh, the Bilbao crystallographic server, we can tell whether our um, our system is topological or not. This I'm going to skip. So, um, so basically, uh, the message that I want to send is that when we have crystalline symmetries we just need to calculate the wave function at the high symmetry points and be able to uh, identify the EREPs. And with that information is enough at least to say whether your system is topological or not. And this can be done with two codes, C2PAC and EREP. C2PAC um, has the advantage that when we want to deal with uh, 
crystalline TIs, not C2, but crystalline TIs, as I told you before, we need the eigenvalues of the symmetry operations. Okay, so C2PAC, what does is calculate the eigenvalues based uh, Wilson loops. And this is something that, as far as I know, Vanier tools or Vanier NIT cannot do. Uh, advantage, it works for DFT codes, Vanier 90 and tight binding models, and calculates actually uh, several invariants like the C2 mirror turn and uh, the turn uh, the turn topological invariant. This is uh, what C2 pack does, and you will show you some exercises uh, about how to calculate um, the Wilson loops based, uh, again, values based Wilson loop for, uh, for Tintel Ride, actually. And then we have this other code that actually, uh, this is very convenient to do a proper symmetry analysis of the crystal. It calculates the irreps and the symmetry can value for every high symmetry points, works for DFT and Vanier IT. And it also calculates some indices like, like C2 and C4. And both of them have uh, the great advantage that there is no need to vanierize. It's just, <laughs> it's just the input of the ab initial calculation so you can avoid uh, all the projections and things like that. Okay, so now I want to say a couple of things. Um, so Stepan said, well, IREP has been main, mainly developed by Mikkel and Stepan, and it's Mikkel the one who's gonna give you some, some exercises. So Stepan said that in order to get a position in the Basque country, you need to actually develop a code and uh, describe it with uh, Basque fonts. These are the Basque fonts. And this is true, but this is just a part of it. You also need to be a regional champion. <laughs> so, Esteban was the runner-up of the Ipuzkoa Championship, and he can lift up to 134 kilos and 164 static, something like that. So in case you need help with your baggages, you know who to call. <laughs> and uh, well, uh, this school is in memorial of our friend Alexei Soloyanov. He was the developer together with Dominic Kress of c 2 Pack when there were almost not co no codes available to calculate the topological invariants. And even now, uh, it seems easy. You vanierize, it's more and more easy to vanierize. We have vanier tools. Back then, around 2013, I think, or 2014, there was almost no codes, and it was really not evident, and we could not understand in the same way topology as we do now. So uh, this is part of the legacy of Alexei, but it's not all of it. Uh, Alexei also together with David um, formulate the obstruction to the C2 topological insulators that actually is the description of the atomic limit that is, has been fundamental to develop of the topo uh, crystalline symmetries based um, topological classification. And no, not only that, he also predicted the first uh, nodal line in materials and the type two vial in, well, I mean, he was an extraordinary and outstanding uh, scientist, but he was also a wonderful and caring friend. So I will join the organizers to say that we miss you, Alexei. Thank you. Um, and, now uh, we're gonna start the real Hanson session with this theoretical background. I hope I convinced you that irreps and eigenvalues are very important. If not, I'm sure Mikkel or Inigo will do it. Maybe while they set up. If, if there are any questions from participants in presence here, raise your hand. Oh. Stepan, is there anyone having questions down at the uh, Adriatico? Any questions here? No, so far. Okay, so. Okay, I'm 
moment, please. No, I'm uh, okay. connecting to the to the other thing. Yeah. Okay, so Michael will conduct the session, but then you and I can help with any problem that you might encounter. Okay, so so the first thing that we have to do is uh, get the the script that is going to guide our session, so we can find it in the GitHub of the developers of Anio 90. Here. And in view code, we go just to the to our sessions directory. And it's here already. So okay, I'm going to start uh, by by presenting IREP, the it's a Python package that calculates irreducible representations of <coughs> DFT bands. So the question is, why do we need IREP? So as Maya said, uh, we can determine the, the topology, we can diagnose the topology and classify the topology of our DFT materials, our DFT calculations, uh, if we have uh, the irreducible representations of balance bands. So IREP is uh, a code that calculates, a Python code that calculates these irreducible representations of balance bands. So uh, good, how does it work? How does it determine the irreducible representation? So it, for that, it uses traces, okay? So I, when we calculate with DFT uh, the wave function, a wave function in our band, okay, what we, are, uh, what we mean is that we have the coefficients of the expansion of this uh, block state in a, in a particular basis. So for example, in the case of bus, quantum espresso, these bases are plane waves, okay? So uh, then when we want to uh, to calculate how this uh, state transforms, we need to know how our basis transforms and the symmetry operations of the space group. Okay, and after that, we can just take the the the, the bra here, so we calculate the the bracket and the traces. So why do we need traces? Uh, every representation, and in particular, irreducible representations, are characterized for their traces. So remember that in our representation, we have a matrix for each uh, symmetry operation of our group. Okay. And then the set of traces of these uh, matrices is uh, unique for each re uh, irreducible representation. So each irreducible representation has its own traces of symmetry operations, which is called character. So what IREP does is just read this, uh, the coefficients of this expansion of our block waves, calculate the traces, and compare them with the traces of, that are in the tables of irreducible representations. OK, so why is IREP a, a good code? Why is it good to use IREP? First of all, it works for all 230 space groups with calculations that uh, include or don't include spin orbit coupling. Uh, it can work with many DFT codes, BAS, Pavinit, Quantum Espresso, and codes that have interfaces uh, to Vanier 90 because it also reads the input files of Vanier 90. Uh, you can do your, you can run your DFT calculation in any unit cell because then IREP is going to transform it to the unit cell used for the for the, uh, to write the, the tables of IREPs. And uh, it uses the same notation as with the Bilbao crystallographic server, which is a widely used server to, to look the IREPs. And it's open source, which means that it's free. Okay, it's very easily installed. We are not going to install it here because it's al already installed for us, but it's very easy to install it. You just have to, re uh, to type pip install IREP in a command line inter interface, and it's done. Okay, you can also install it in a development mode if you want to, to be develop the code or make some changes. Okay, so we are going to start now with our first example. We are going to apply IREP. So the first thing that we have to do is copy the... So we are in our home directory. Let me delete this. So we have to copy uh, the, the material in our home directory. And it's the second session. Okay. So it's copying, and we have it now. 
So what we, are, we are going to start with Team Telluride and we are going to calculate the, the reducible representations of balanced bands. And we are also going to check the calculation of the set two and set four numbers. So let's go uh, to our uh, directory. You see that there are many directories here. We are working with irrep, Team Telluride, the part of, no, okay. So let me explain you that first. Uh, when we want to run irrep, of course, we need the wave function. So we, we need to run a DFT calculation, DFT calculation in order to, to get these wave functions. So the first step is always uh, that, to run a DFT calculation. Uh, here we have run a DFT, uh, a DFT calculation with quantum espresso for you because uh, it's, it takes some time and we just want to focus on running irrep. So uh, we have uh, placed in the directory DFT all the the input files that you need to, to run this calculation with Quantum Espresso, and also the outputs. In particular, the out directory here contains the wave functions. So uh, let's start with irrep. We come to its folder and to the first example, which is to calculate the irreps at maximal k points, okay? Okay, so everyone is here, right? Good. So. Uh, as I said, we have the, the band structure and the wave functions calculated with uh, quantum espresso. And uh, we are going to run it. For, for that, first, we have to activate our uh, Python environment. So we do it with this command. Okay, you, you will see that it's activated now. And we are going to run it. So this is the command, the, the one here that we are going to run. Let me first comment on the parameters that we are setting in, the, uh, in this command, okay? So you will see that there are some uh, names or parameters that, are, that start by a dash, like code here. Okay, these are the actual names of the parameters that we can, uh, that we can tune when we run irrep. So for example, here we are telling irrep that the DFT calculation was done with, the, with quantum espresso. Okay, in perfect, we are giving to it the path to the directory that contains, as I said, our, no, the wave functions that we calculated, and SNT is the, the prefix argument that we set when running quantum espresso. What's ECAT? ECAT is the cutoff that irrep adopts uh, for the wave functions. Okay, so remember that our wave functions are expanded in terms of plane waves, so here we are getting rid of the coefficients that correspond to, to plane waves of energy larger than 50 EV. Why? Because usually the information, no, most part of the information of a wave function is, is, uh, is stored in the, in the shortest uh, wave, in the plane waves with shortest uh, wave number. Okay, so k points. This is a, uh, usually a list of indices, which indices? So in our DFT calculation, we, we, we had many k points, but we want the irreducible representations of the first k point, the 16th k point, the k point number 31 and 46, okay? We are just selecting the k points that we, we are interested in. And this kp name seems similar. It's telling you that the first k point is labeled as x, the second k point, the 16th k point is labeled as w, and so on. How can we know the, the labels that we have to set? So with Bilbao Crystallographic Serve. There's a program here. If you go to the first uh, toolbox, space group symmetry, k back, and if you introduce here the number of your space group, in this case it's a phase center cubic space group, number 225, and hit enter, you see here there are the labels of the, of the k points. Okay, so we are using just the same labels here. That's how we can get the labels we get to know the levels. Uh, with IB end, we are uh, telling Europe that we just want the result representations of the first 30 bands, which are the balanced bands. We, are, we don't care about the conduction bands because they are not related to the topology of our material. And uh, we are telling Europe also to, to parse the, the Fermi energy of, uh, in the quantum espresso calculation. And we are telling it also to, to uh, to save the, the output in our file, in this file. So let's copy this, this command here. We paste it in the, 
the terminal and we run it. Take some seconds. And now let's have a look at the, at the output file, okay? So we don't want wrapping off of the output, okay? So first we have the, it reprints the primitive vectors of our, of the unit cell that we used in the DFT calculation, okay? In this case, it's a primitive unit cell. Then also information about the atoms that are in the, in the unit cell and the reciprocal lattice. And after that, you will find uh, these two matrices, well, the ref UC matrix and the vector shift UC. What's, what's this? So as I, as I, tell you, I told you before, uh, uh, we can run the DFT calculation in any unit cell, as long as then we are able to transform this unit cell to the, to the one that is used to write the irreversible representations in tables, okay? So IREP automatically calculates the transformation to this, uh, to this unit cell so that, you know, we don't, we don't have to take care of it. And uh, this matrix is just uh, express this transformation, okay? So, uh, yes, they express this, uh, the, this equation here. C1, C2, and C3 are the, the matrices, uh, sorry, the vectors that define the unit cell of the, used in the tables. A1, A2, and A3 are the, our uh, DFT uh, primitive vectors, and M is the matrix that ref UC. Shift UC is just expressing the, the shift of the, of the origin of our cell with respect to the unit cell of the of tables. Okay, after that, you will find here a description of the space group, okay, and each symmetry operation of the space group. And after this huge block of of information of the space group, you will, find, you will find our main output, which are the traces of symmetry operations and the irreversible representations, as you see. So for example, we have such a block for each of the k points. This is the k point 0 0.5, 0, 0 0.5, and the irreversible representations of, of the bands, okay? So for example, if we take the, the band structure, we can place the, the irreversible representations on top of, of our bands. So for example, at the point x here, we see that the last balance band has irrep x9. The, the previous band has x8. The same happens for, a, uh, for can be done for w. So we have w7, w6, w7, in the same order, as you see. So this gives us knowledge about the irreversible representations of our balance bands. And before closing this file, let me show you that there's a particular in, uh, symmetry operation which is very interesting for us, which is this one the 25th operation, it's inversion, okay? You see that the corresponding matrix is inversion. This is going to be important later when we want to check the calculation of the set four and set two numbers. Okay, so, okay, we have the reusable representations of our balance bands, but we don't know yet whether they are topological or not. For that, we have to take these reusable representations and check if, as Maya said, if they can be written as, as combination, linear combination of EBRs. Okay, if they can be written with integer positive coefficients, then our bands uh, are trivial, and otherwise they are topological. So we have to do this work. For that, you will realize that in the directory where you run irrep, there's a file, trace.txt, which was created by, by irrep, okay? And uh, it's, going to, uh, it's going to be used now to, to determine if our bands are topological or not. So we go to the below crystallographic server, and we are going to upload this file, where we hit uh, on the black box, topological quantum chemistry, check topological math. Okay, so we are older, right? And we, are, we have to, to upload the trace.txt file. Okay, we hit show, and it's going to tell us whether our bands are topological or not. Okay, so let me anticipate the result. It's here, so it tells us to have a picture also there. But so uh, it's going to tell us that our bands are top, uh, topological, okay? And they have, yeah? So it's the same result as here. So the, it tells us that our 30 balance bands are topological, because they cannot be written as a, as a sum of linear combination of EBRs. And the topology is characterized by this, is indicated by these symmetry-based indicators, okay? So the set two and set four numbers are zero, and the set eight number is four, which means that our material, uh, tin right here, can be a, 
uh, it's a, a mirror chain insulator, okay, and it can be two different kinds of mirror chain insulators. Later on, Inigo will use set to pack to to tell to determine which of the insulators is the one of our phase. Okay, so let me continue now by checking the, the calculation of this set two and set four numbers. So how can we do that? These numbers are related to the inversion eigenvalues, okay? They are obtained from inversion eigenvalues, and IREP can calculate inversion eigenvalues. That's why I, I, I insisted before on the symmetry operation 25, which is inversion. So we are going to do a calculation with IREP, another calculation to check these numbers. Okay, so we are here, okay, in this path, IREP, inversion separate in this directory, and here uh, we are going to, to run a command to, to separate. So we want, uh, at the end of the day, we want to, ca to count the number of inversion odd Kramer spares that we have, okay, in our balance bands. So for that, we are going to, with error, separate our bands into two subspaces. One corresponding to uh, odd behavior res uh, with respect to uh, inversion, and the other one, e the even subspace, okay? So here, we are telling IREP that we want to separate our balance bands based on eigenvalues of the 25th symmetry operation, which, if you remember, it's inversion, okay? The code is very, the command is very similar to the previous one, just we are getting rid, if you remember, there was a K point W, now we are getting rid of it because uh, it's, it's a maximal K point, but it's not left invariant under inversion, which means that if you apply inversion to it, it doesn't go, it doesn't go to an equivalent K point in every and so on. So, uh, let's run the calculation, okay, we copy this command here, we passed it in our terminal, and we run the calculation. Again, it takes some seconds. Now we are going to open the, the output file and we are going to check that, the, that our bands were separated by inversion, based on inversion, so. So again, if we skip the information which is repeated, it's the same as in the previous calculation. And we, we reach the, the blocks corresponding to our uh, irreps, you see? So it's telling us that uh, we have separated our bands based on the 25th operation, inversion, and first it's listing the, the bands corresponding to, to even eigenvalue of inversion. And if you go down, okay, you will see that there are there's also a block corresponding to, you see the inversion odd eigenvalues. And a nice feature of IREP is that it automatically ca uh, counts the Kramer's, the odd Kramer spares for us. So for example here, at the point X, we have three odd Kramer spares, okay? With this information, we can apply the formulas to calculate the set two and set four numbers. So the set two number is calculated just with the Fuke, famous Fukering formulas, which consists on counting the number of Kramer's uh, odd, cr odd Kramer spares in all the time reversal invariant momenta in our previous zone, okay? So, uh, there are, uh, at gamma, there are three uh, odd Kramer spares. Yeah, here. Here, at X, there are another three uh, cr odd Kramer spares, but the X point appears three times in, the, in our brilliant zone, so we have to multiply for, by three. There are seven odd Kramer spares at L, but, we, but there are four L points at the brilliant zone. So uh, we calculate this, this multiplication, okay? It gives 40, but this set two number is defined modulo two. So at the end of the day, it's equivalent to set two equal to zero, as the blue crystallographer server told us from IREP's output. We can apply also this formula to calculate the set four number, okay? It's just, okay. So <laughs> let me ask the question on, on the chat. Okay, so uh, someone is asking what's the meaning of the set eight uh, equal to four. So uh, it means that our material can be, well, it's a topological insulator first, and it can be, uh, it's a mirror chain insulator. It can belong to two different phases of a mirror chain insulator, okay? And in US later, so at this point, we don't know which of the insulators is, just by looking at these symmetry-based indicators. We, we have to calculate 
the Wilson loops. And in US, later going to use set to pack to, to tell us which of the insulator is actually the one that we have. Uh, isimsep is telling irrep that we want to, to split the bands that we have in terms of the inversion eigenvalues, okay? The 25th symmetry operation, which as I said, it's inversion. Okay, so they are also asking what's, uh, if there is a fourfold degeneracy at a time resolving variable moment with trace zero. So, okay, uh, there can be uh, symmetry operations which have trace zero. Even, I mean, if they are twofold, if they correspond to twofold, they generate uh, wave functions or fourfold, they generate wave functions, it, it doesn't matter. So, it's not important if there's a single symmetry operation with trace zero. What is important is the, the set of traces corresponding to all symmetry operations. That's what characterizes the, the irreducible representation. So, in principle, there's not, a, there's not any problem. Okay, so if there was such a, I mean, a non-sensible uh, result, I would recommend to check the, the DFT calculation and improve its, its convergence in principle. And also check if we are uh, typing the command correctly. But in principle, there's not any problem with having a, just a trace of a symmetry operation equal to zero. Good. So, uh, as I said, we can calculate the set for number with this formula here. Again, irrep has counted the inversion odd and inversion even uh, states, more Kramer spares for us. We just apply the formula, which gives, again, uh, a number that is zero because this set for number is defined modulo four. Okay, so remember that this is the, the result that uh, the low crystallographer, crystallographic server told us from the information of irreducible representations that we calculated with with irrep. Okay, so are there any questions or any comments? Okay, maybe in, yeah, maybe they're down uh, in Adriatico. Is there any question or? No, so far. Okay, so. Uh, okay, so let me explain the idea of this of this calculation now. Okay, it's another example which illustrates another application of irrep. So as I I have uh, shown now, irrep is able to to separate the bands based on inversion and values, but not only inversion, also uh, with respect to other uh, symmetry operations. So we are going to illustrate this this application in a different scenario here, okay? So, imagine that we have taken, for example, this material, okay, copper tubismot oxide, and we have calculated its band structure along this path, the gamma and X path, okay? And we say, okay, there are, there are crossings here. So this band that is coming down, it's crossing the almost flat or horizontal bands. But, okay, are we sure that there are band crossings here? So we can zoom in, of course, but uh, I, I can keep asking this question for, right? are, are you sure that there are crossings here? So uh, a quantitative way of doing that is uh, separating the, the bands in terms of a uh, symmetry operation. So because two bands that uh, have different eigenvalues of a symmetry operation, uh, they cannot uh, have anti-crosses between them. If, if they, well, yes, they are going to cross for sure, okay, if they meet at, a, at an energy. So if they, had the, they belong to the same irreducible representation, then it would be very, uh, much more difficult to have crossings between these two bands. Okay, so uh, in this material, we are going to, uh, to check if these bands do really cross. So we are going to use irre for that. The first thing that we have to do is, okay, we have our states, which, can, uh, which could be the symmetry operation that is protecting our crossing. So, uh, for that, we have to, to, to determine that symmetry operation, okay? So, let's go to, to the other material that we have. Copper tubismot oxide. There are some directors here. Again, we have done the DFT calculation for you with quantum espresso, and the input files and output files are in the DFT uh, directory. We come to the IREP directory, and we are going to run IREP here. So, 
the first thing is to get to know the, the symmetry operation that may be protecting the, the crossings. So for that, we are going to run irrep, but with the only, si only sim label. This is telling irrep to read the, the read information of the unit cell, determine the space group and the symmetry operations, and to stop after it does so. So okay, here are our symmetry operations like before, and there's a particular, particularly interesting symmetry operation which is this one, 14. Why? Because we are interested in the bands that are connecting gamma and x, okay? And points at this line have uh, have the shape of zero, a second component that can be different from zero between zero and 0 0.5, and again the third component is zero. So such k vectors are left invariant by this operation, okay? because this operation leaves uh, invariant the, the only component that these k-points have. So this operation is in, is in the little group of these uh, k-points. Good. So it's a, a candidate to be the symmetry that is protecting our crossings. So, yeah. Uh, so what if the crossing occurs somewhere not along the high symmetry line? Yeah, you mean, okay, in a line with less symmetry. So as long there are symmetries in your space group, crystal symmetries, I mean, for, uh, apart from identity, you can uh, still apply this procedure by using the symmetries that are left. In general, if you have a crossing at a, a general k-point, which only is left invariant by inversion, uh, sorry, by identity, then the procedure is more subtle because there, mean, there are not crystal symmetries protecting our crossings. Yeah, the, the crossings may exist, but uh, they are not protected by a crystal symmetry. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good, so as I said, the 14th symmetry operation it looks like a potential candidate to be, pro uh, to be the one that is protecting our crossing, so let's check if that's the case, okay? So we are going to, to copy the, this command here, and we are going to run it. Again, we are telling here to separate our bands based on IM values of the 14th symmetry operation, okay? And we are telling it also to, to generate files that may be used uh, for band plotting. Okay, so let's copy this command. We paste it in our command line and we run it. Okay, so let me ask while it's running, let me have a look at the Zoom chat. Yes, so someone is asking, if we can apply irrep to calculate reusable representations of our conduction bands. And the answer is yes. There are two parameters which, for example, appear in this, in this command here that we are running just now, okay, IB end and IB start. start. So these parameters can be used to, to tell irrep which are the bands we, we are interested in. So for which bands we want to calculate the irreducible representations. In this case, we are telling irrep to calculate the the reusable representations to the bands 129, 130, 31, and 32. Okay, so the bands that are in the range specified by this IB start and IB end uh, parameters. So, irrep is not valid just for the balance bands. It can be used for any set of bands that, that you have. There's another question. Ah, okay. So there's another question. Related to the uh, above question of Nico, when I'm just interested in the symmetry levels at high symmetry K points, which symmetry level will the code write? This happens, uh, for example, at X point of diamond, for example. Okay. Will the code write? You mean which symmetry operation is going to write? So, okay, that's, that's a good question. So, in general, here, for example, you see that it's writing uh, just a single form of a symmetry operation, okay? But in, the, in our previous results, I'm going to show you now, okay? So in our, you just don't have to follow my steps now. So 
if you open uh, the output file, you will see that here, for example, is writing the two matrices for the rotational part, and also for the spinal rotation and so on. That's because the unicell that we used for the DFT calculation is not identical to the unicell that we used for that is used for uh, to write the irreducible representations in the tables. So IRB uh, has calculated the transformation matrix to this uh, conventional unit cell. Okay, then it's going to pr it has printed the the symmetry operations uh, represent no, the symmetry operations expressions for no, both in the DFT unit cell and in the in the unit cell of the conventional uh, of the alpha hour tables. So it's going to give the description of uh, both expressions of this symmetry operation. Good. So let's have a look now at the output file that was generated by our last run of IREP. Okay. Remember that we wanted to, cal to separate our, our bands based on the 14th symmetry operation. And you see that it, it has been done so. So if, if we skip the, the symmetry operations description, you see it's uh, the eigenvalues, well, the bands have been separated according to plus one and minus one eigenvalues of the 14th symmetry operation. And more interestingly, IREP has generated some uh, files that are used or that can be used as we specified with the, with the argument uh, plot bands here. It has also created or generated the files that we can pass to Nuplot in order to, to plot our band, uh, our bands, okay, separated by this inversion I value. So there's a file here prepared for you. Run Nuplot, which only contains, it just contains a, a, a Nuplot command. You can run it, okay, and it's going to generate the it's going to generate the the files, a file with the a file with the uh, with the plot of the bands. Okay, so it's just this file that I showed you before, this one in the right. So uh, here, the the red band, the red bands correspond. I can make this bigger. So the red bands correspond to to eigenvalue minus one of, of the 14th symmetry operation, which is 14th symmetry operation is a glide uh, reflection, okay, with respect to the x-plane. And also in blue, the, the bands with plus one uh, eigenvalue. So it's clear that these bands are crossing. They can, there cannot be any con discontinuity between these uh, bands here. So that was another, the illustration of another applicability of IREP. And, okay, so that's, uh, from my side, that's uh, the presentation of IREP. I encourage you to, uh, to, to use IREP, of course, and also to collaborate in it if you want uh, by reporting us bugs, uh, giving us your feedback, and if you want to contribute, it has its own GitHub repository. Uh, so I encourage you to, to do so. And I want to finish this by thanking uh, to Stepan for his patience and for let me, letting me work his scheme, which is a pleasure. And now I'm free, I'm uh, ready to take questions if there, there are any. Okay, so there's a question in the Zoom chat. Can you please tell again how the labels in figure two are written? Okay, yes. So I guess that. Uh, ah, okay, these labels. Yes. So these are the visual representations of our balance bands. So how can we 
uh, identify them. So, okay. So let, let me show you the, the output file from which we got them. Okay, so they are here in our output file. So for example, let's, let's do it. Let's do it for the gamma point. So for example, we see that the, the last balance band, which is the one at the bottom, okay, at energy more or less uh, minus 1.7, so this one, has irreducible representation uh, gamma bar 11. Okay, the next uh, balance band has uh, irreducible representation gamma 8, and so forth. Uh, and this is the way in which it's done. For example, for L, okay, Let's see if I can, okay. So, for example, for L, we can see that the last balance band has irreducible representation L9, okay, like it's indicated here, and L4, L5 for the previous one. So you can do this for all the key points, okay? And that's the way in which you can uh, you can place your irreducible representations on top of a band structure. Okay, there's another question by Rafael. Is it possible to calculate the irreducible representation for magnetic symmetry operations? So that's a very interesting question also. Uh, at this point, we... we, we haven't yet uh, implemented the magnetic, well, yes, the magnetic groups in Europe. So it's something that we, we hope to do at some point, but we still haven't done so. So at this point, Europe just works uh, for the non-magnetic space group, 230 space groups. But in the future, we hope to do, to do so. Okay, any other question? Maybe the last question. Uh, how can we see the band inversion for this example of the topological material? I think it was uh, bismuth selenate. Uh. Okay. So uh, that's okay. That's a, a good question. A good question. So we are sure that there's a. Uh, a kind of band inversion which makes our topological bands, uh, our balance bands topological. So probably some, uh, th there will be an irrep at some point and maybe at L because the gap is quite uh, small here, but uh, I cannot uh, say, tell it for sure. Uh, there will be a, a K point at which the, our bands have been inverted and there's going to be content, uh, there's going to be a, an irrep at a conduction band which if we exchange it with certain irreps of the balance band is going to give us uh, balance bands that are trivial. So uh, the way in which you could do that is just uh, calculate the irreducible representations also for the at least first conduction bands, okay, the let's say smaller energy conduction bands and check which are the exchanges that uh, could give you trivial bands. So switch over, so that will be the topological material, right? Yeah, exactly. So you have to uh, check the, the exchanges that give you uh, trivial or topological bands. You can use for that also the tables of the topological, uh, of the Bilbao crystallographic server in which you have the elementary band representation. So that you can see which exchanges give you bands that can be written as a combination of elementary band representations. Because I think it is nicer than you can see which bands uh, invert uh, other than just uh, you know, uploading a file to, to the server and then it tells, oh, you have something interesting going on. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that would be a cool future, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I think we should stop here for the lunch break. Let's thank again our speakers.